In this short video, we're going to talk about indefinite integrals. Well, an indefinite integral is really just another phrase for asking about the most general antiderivative. When we learned about antiderivatives, we really didn't have any notation to indicate an antiderivative. And so now we're going to use the integral sign. So we just write the integral sign, but with no bounds. That indicates that we're just asking for the antiderivative without any evaluation. So as an example, if I write the integral sign with no bounds, then this would be the indefinite integral of x squared plus 2x dx. In other words, this is asking for the most general antiderivative of x squared plus 2x. And we know the antiderivative of x squared is 1 third x cubed. The antiderivative of 2x is x squared. And then we have to add a constant. So this constant we have to remember, and sometimes we call this constant the constant of integration, but it really comes from the antiderivative. So again, there's no bounds on the integration and there's no evaluation. So the output from an indefinite integral is just a formula for that antiderivative. So let's look at some more examples. Really what this does is it gives us a chance to practice finding antiderivatives using some different techniques without getting uh, tied up in the evaluation. So uh, when I look at this uh, integrand here, sine of 2x over sine of x, um, yeah, I, I realize that I don't know any antiderivative for that uh, particular function, the way it's written. So uh, I'm going to have to use an identity or some type of algebra to simplify it to the point that it looks like something that I know the antiderivative of. For example, if I use the identity for sine of 2x, the double angle formula, I would get 2 sine of x cosine of x in the numerator. And now I have a common factor of sine of x. That'll divide to make 1. And so all I need to do is find the antiderivative of 2 cosine x, which is just 2 sine of x, and then plus c to make it the most general antiderivative. In our second example here, or in part b of this example, uh, we have a polynomial. It's actually a binomial and it's squared. So again, the way it's written, um, we don't know any rules for finding the antiderivative, but it's a simple algebra step to actually use FOIL and multiply out that uh, square of the binomial. So now I just have powers of x, and I can use the power rule for antiderivatives. And I'll use that a little bit carefully. Um, antiderivative of 1 is x. The antiderivative of x to the fourth, I mean, sorry, of x cubed is 1 fourth x to the power of 4 but that has to be multiplied by 2. And then the antiderivative of x to the power of 6 is x to the power of 7 divided by 7. And of course, plus c to make the most general antiderivative. So I can just simplify that a little bit and uh, have a nice clean antiderivative for my answer. Um, okay, part C of this example is actually pretty straightforward. The only thing that we have to remember is that this symbol pi represents a constant. So just like the antiderivative of 1 would be just 1 times x, um, the antiderivative of 5 would be 5x, the antiderivative of pi is pi x. And then secant theta tangent theta, we recognize that as the derivative of secant theta, so its antiderivative will just be secant theta. So 
the antiderivative of pi. I said pi x, but I, I did not see that our variable here is theta. So the antiderivative of pi with respect to theta would be pi theta. And then the antiderivative of secant theta, tangent theta is secant theta. And of course, plus c to make it the most general antiderivative. In part d, I have a, an algebraic fraction. And um, again, the way it's written, I can't find an antiderivative. So I'm going to have to do something with this algebraic fraction. And so one thing I could do is uh, I'll start by writing the cube root as x to the power of 1 third, uh, so that now I have powers of x and I could use the power rule. But I still need to divide each term in the numerator by x to the power of 1 third which is in the denominator. So let's take the time to do that carefully. So each term, so I'm going to have three divisions performed here. So when I have one over x to the power of one third, I can write that as a power of x with a negative exponent. And when I have x to the one third over x to the one third, a number divided by itself is one. And so 2x over uh, x to the 1 third, well, x is the same as x to the power of 1, which is the same as x to the power of 3 over 3. So now I can just remember my rules of exponents. I'm dividing powers with the same base, so I can just subtract the exponents. And that's how I get my integrand, which is x raised to the power of negative one third plus one plus two x raised to the power of two thirds. And now I can just use the um, power rule for antiderivatives. And I'm going to do that again a little bit carefully. I'm not going to try to do too much arithmetic in my in my head. For the first ter two terms, um, there is no extra work to be done. Uh, I'm going to add one to negative one third. So adding one to negative one third, that's adding three over three. So that's going to be two thirds. That's my new exponent. So then I would divide by two thirds. But remember, dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So that's why I have three halves x to the two thirds. Antiderivative of 1 is just x. And then for 2x raised to the 2 thirds, remember, I'll have to add 1 to the exponents. So 1 is the same as 3 thirds. So 2 thirds plus 3 thirds makes 5 thirds. I would have to divide by 5 thirds. But dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So I'll have to multiply it by 3 over 5. And I still have the multiplier 2. So bringing all that together, I'll get 3 halves x to the power of 2 thirds plus x plus 6 fifths x to the power of 5 thirds and plus c. So we need to distinguish between definite versus indefinite integrals. And so with definite integrals, what do we have? Much of the same notation, but the real key is that we have bounds, numerical or some other types of bounds of integration. And when there are numbers there, when we do the, we have to do an evaluation. We have to find an antiderivative. Doesn't have to be the most general antiderivative when we're doing definite integrals. We do not write any plus c. And so let me actually make a note of that right now. So that there's.
So you have no plus C when you find the antiderivative with definite integrals. And your final answer is going to be a number. With indefinite integrals, there are no bounds of integration. So it's only asking you to find the most general antiderivative. So again, what did I do here? I just used the power rule for antiderivatives. So I had x to the power of 5 thirds. I'm going to add 1. 1 is the same as 3 thirds. So 5 thirds plus 3 thirds gives me 8 thirds. I would divide by 8 thirds, but that's the same as multiplying times 3 eighths. In the second term, I have x to the power of 2 fifths. So add 1. 1 is the same as 5 over 5. 2 over 5 plus 5 over 5 makes 7 over 5. And dividing by 7 over 5 is the same as multiplying times 5 over 7. And then here, I need to have the plus c. So remember, with definite integrals, no plus c. Indefinite integrals, we need the plus c. And the answer from an indefinite integral is a formula for the antiderivative. And remember that plus c for indefinite integrals.